Okay, good morning. Welcome to our payroll hot topics. Uh, we have a lot to share with you today. Uh, just a reminder, thank you to mute our mics. Perfect. Um, so um, we have a few uh, people joining us this morning. We have Marie Baker and uh, Sydney Williams from the Grants and Funds Management Office. Uh, they're going to be talking about uh, funding end dates for projects. We have um, Lindsay, Wanda, Jacob, and Jennifer Story, all from our payroll uh, office, and you know, also the controller's office. And then also we have Belinda Agoric, who's going to, who's here to uh, answer any questions related to HR all along the way, because as they just stated, um, they are partners here, and so uh, they're uh, they're here to support each other. All right, let's get started with our agenda. Just a reminder to mute our mics, please. Okay. All right, so we're going to start our, our presentation talking about funding end dates. Sorry, guys, I'm just monitoring our, uh, our attendees and making sure everybody is muted. Thank you. We're going to begin the, the uh, session by talking about uh, funding end dates for projects. And uh, Marie is going to be talking about risk accounts as well. Um, we're going to turn it over to Jennifer to talk about furlough and COVID pay. We've got to make sure that everyone is selecting the correct codes and ITAMs. Um, there have been some questions about student hires and uh, what goes through HR versus what um, students are paid using AP. Um, international payroll, Jake is going to share some information about that with you today. We have some additional topics and that's where um, uh, Wanda and Lindsay will pick up uh, talking about overpayments, pack, uh, payroll tax deferral update, CARES Act, summer comp, and then workers comp and unemployment. And then finally, I'm going to end the presentation by talking about time and labor and absence management, which hopefully you all received a, uh, an email about yesterday. So uh, with that said, I'm going to pass the presentation over to Sydney and she's going to get started uh, with talking about funding end dates for projects. All righty. The funding end dates in HCM were added at the end of July, which means payroll can no longer post past the end date of an award. If an employee is still going to post when payroll closes, they will be moved to an A or an E fund based on the employee's HCM home department. And for employees paid on a lag, it's important to note that the funding end date is ran against when the payroll is earned, not the check date. So for example, if your project ended 8:31, the payroll will still post for 9:15 to the award since the payroll was earned at the end of August, but it would be rerouted for 9:30 payroll since that was earned after the end date of the award. For any USC SP projects, business managers and PI should be getting their 90 and 30 day notices before the project ends, which would be a great time to look at payroll to see if any account changes are needed or if a project or an award needs to be extended on risk. And if any um, payroll does get rerouted, they can still be moved to the correct funding source with a retro funding change after the payroll post. Good morning. So if you are expecting a new year of funding and you get the email from the payroll GFM box that you have employees needing account changes, um, the first step that you would need to do is reach out to the SAM administrator and work on a risk account um, to get either the award extended or get a new award set up. Like Sydney mentioned, you get the nine, the um, project team gets the 90 and 30 day emails. We highly suggest working on risk account extensions or setting up a new account as a risk account um, and beginning that process 60 to 90 days in advance. Um, there's a lot of moving parts. Um, you might have to get departmental approval or dean level approval to set up the risk account, which can take some time. And then we need a couple weeks to get the account set up and get combo codes and all of that moving um, in plenty of time to make sure no one misses a pay or nobody falls off payroll. Um, which does happen, which has happened. So we try our hardest to send out as many reminders as we can. Um, you know, and if you have any questions, you can reach out to myself or Sydney. You know, in terms of um, 
any employees that you're not sure whether they're going to fall off payroll or not um, on the awards. <clears throat> but if that risk account isn't set up or an additional funding source after the end date is not established, like Sydney said, we will have to redirect that to an A or an E fund. And at the time that a new award is set up, you would either have to retro that onto the project um, to be able to have that payroll charge to the grant. And we do have two queries in HCM to help identify the employees that do need those account changes. And we would like you to run these queries at least two to three weeks in advance to allow ample time to get account changes in and the e-forms executed. And below is a screenshot of the by project date query, which is the one I use the most. So for the funding end date, I usually put the date for the up and coming payroll, which if I ran it today would be 1015. And for the project, you can put a project in this field or you can leave it blank and it should bring back any projects that you have access to in HCM. And for the fiscal year, you cannot forget to put 2021 in or the current fiscal year. And if you leave the project blank, it's a good idea to put um, USCSP for the business unit. And if no one has any questions, we'll turn it over to Jennifer. All right, hey guys, um, we just kind of wanted to go over the um, furlough reporting and ITAMs, um, just make sure everybody's using the correct codes and see if there were any questions around that. So um, there are two separate codes and ITAMs. One is the mandatory furlough. Um, so those days need to be reported under that code, um, furlough M. And then the voluntary furlough needs to be reported under um, furlough vol unpaid furlough hours. Um, you know, it's really important that the ITAMs approvers make sure that their employees are putting these hours under the correct codes um, because they're handled differently. Um, you know, the voluntary shorts the pay then, whereas the mandatory is shorting it over a period of time. Um, so we really just want to make sure that everybody's entering it under those correct codes. Um, we need to make sure that the mandatory days are taken, but do not exceed the number they were supposed to. And then for those exempt employees that they are taken in five consecutive days. Um, so that means, you know, for mandatory, they should be entered Monday through Friday and then no works performed on that Sunday or Saturday as well. All right. Um, we also do suggest since, you know, a mandatory furlough is planned um, that it must be entered into ITAMs at least a week before it's taken. Um, and it's strongly recommended to have a timekeeper enter these hours on behalf of the employee um, just to make sure they're entering it correctly and it, you know, it's accurate um, in ITAMs. Um, and then there's just a note here that all the 12 month exempt employees affected by mandatory, um, the reduction in salary started on 715 and then the nine month um, reduction in salary started on the 831 check. So they should already be seeing those things. So once they are taking those days for mandatory, make sure they're getting entered on the timesheet um, appropriately under that correct code. Um, anybody that has signed up to do voluntary furlough, make sure that they're entering it under the voluntary furlough code so that their pay um, is deducted accordingly. Any questions? Um, the next slide is the earnings codes um, that are furlough related. So if you see, you'll, you may see these in HCM distribution. Um, these are the furlough codes. They're based on um, the pay basis, whether they're 9, 10 and a half, 11 or 12, and then how many days um, they were subject to take um, based on the mandatory furlough. Um, the two codes at the bottom are voluntary furlough, um, one's for their salary and the other one's for any supplemental pay. All right. If there's no All questions, right. I'll pass it on. Hello, everybody. This is Jake. Um, we have just a couple updated policies and uh, new things in the international payroll realm. One is our tax information form that we have all of our new hires fill out. We've actually updated that form. 
Um, basically, we've simplified it so that it only has payroll related questions instead of those that might apply to accounts payable. Um, if there is an international payment being made um, to an international person, the accounts payable controller's office department actually has their own version of the form now. Um, any incomplete forms will be returned. We, st we still need a signature on the form, but we do um, allow the e-signatures on those. That is acceptable, and the form is now fillable electronically um, for anybody who is not able to print it out. Also, if, if your department has a prior version of the form on file, um, because I still see some of those old versions, sometimes they're two or three versions of the form ago where they still have like a social on a place for the social security number. We don't want that form anymore. We want everybody to use the new updated form. Um, so you can find that on the international payroll page of the payroll department website. And if you have any trouble finding it or anything, you can always reach out to me and I'll be happy to send you the link to the form. Um, the other uh, kind of topic is international hires for people who are working overseas. So anybody who is working in a foreign country, we are not set up to pay people working in foreign countries. Um, basically, we can't report the tax correctly to that country. Like if, for example, if somebody is working in Germany, we would have to report that income to Germany just like we do in the United States. And we're not set up to do that. So that's basically a liability for the university. So nobody should be being hired who is working overseas. If you know of anybody who's physically working outside of the US, please let me know so that we can figure out the best way to handle that situation. Jacob, can I just make sure um, this is Belinda, that that means students as well? Students as well, right? Anybody, anybody who's an employee. Thanks. Thank you, Belinda. Um, okay, if there's no questions, passing it on. Well, Belinda's timing for us mentioning our students is impeccable because that's the next section of our presentation. I wanted to kind of go back over the previous presentations and give you guys some pointers. I think we really need to make sure that you um, concentrate on as you go back and read back through this presentation. One of those are the points that Sydney pointed out, which is that payroll on ended projects will shift to your A or E fund. So keep in mind that the timeliness of getting these transactions processed related to project end dates um, is key to having um, these funds not hit your A or E fund. So make sure that you, you go back and you pay attention to these emails that um, Joanne sends out on a regular basis that basically gives us a heads up um, about the timing of all the entries that be, that need to be made related to project end dates, because if not, your A or E fund is impacted. Um, and that kind of leads into the point of what um, Marie was talking about. Is she says, if you are not requested, if you're um, if you have a new fun, new year funding for an award, if it's not requested and set up on time, you will yourself will have to move things to your A or E fund. So all of these project end dates impact your A or E fund. So that's why it's key to make sure you get things done um, timely so that um, we understand um, what is actually flowing through your AE fund related to your project index and why things flow through there. Also, uh, the furlough codes that Jennifer mentioned, um, the reason why we want to kind of like go through these again, and Jennifer did a great job kind of explaining what they are is because we often get questions in payroll when it comes to um, the furlough amounts for pay and uh, when does my when do I take my days and does it matter when I take my days and those questions are often shared between payroll and HR, which is why Belinda and I were kind of hinting at that at the beginning of this presentation. We spent a lot of time communicating back and forth on subjects and one of those subjects is furloughs. So as you kind of go back and look back through that, um, kind of understand the difference between the mandatory and the voluntary and make sure that whomever in within your department is uh, taking a furlough that it's clearly explained to them what the difference is between the two. But Lynn, I don't know if you want to add some more on that or be good with that. Um, I, I would just say remember the voluntary furlough. Um, there's a uh, form if anybody is doing one that is completed and sent the salary admin box because it's an agreement that they understand what the voluntary furlough is and what it means um, because that is um, 
you know, as it says, voluntary, but we do need to have that form um, if anybody's doing it. We haven't had a lot currently doing the voluntary furlough, um, but we've had, had some. So just a reminder that if anybody's doing the voluntary furlough, that they need to um, complete the voluntary furlough agreement form, and that would need to be sent in salary admin, and that will be going in their file. Thanks, Wanda. Oh, you're welcome. And these furlough uncodes <coughs> are just a small portion of our uncodes. I was in a previous presentation a week or so ago, and we kind of had a discussion about uncodes. So maybe after this presentation, we'll get with Joanne and kind of uh, come up with a way to publish where all the uncodes are published. And as far as Jacob and international payroll, um, that international payroll form is brand new. Um, it was a split out of the form that was previously uh, shared with AP, correct, Jacob? That's correct. It's, I yeah, mean, AP it's has its own a, form. Yeah. yeah, AP has its own form now, and uh, payroll has its own form. Just make sure that if you, like Jacob said, just reiterating what he said, that you you use the uh, a payroll form for payroll related activity, and that you use the most recent version of the form. So those are just the things that I was going through and making notes. Just want to make sure that we um, highlight uh, as we go through to into the presentation. Now for the student hire piece, uh, Belinda, Lindsay and I are going to play um, tag on this piece because we want to make sure we cover all the issues. So I'm just going to give like a very, very high level um, beginning of this student hire section and then we'll come to the more detailed page follow up and then Belinda and Lindsay will chime in whenever there's things that we need to stress that um, I don't stress. Um, student hires, Students hired through HR, uh, you have to prepare a student hire e-form. Uh, HR has um, all of their training and documentation stored on their on the HR website about how to go through student hires, so we're not going to go through all that. We're just going to reiterate that you need to have a student form for the following students, federal work study students, graduate students, students on grant funding, and international students. All of those student categories need to have a HR student hire form. And in order to find that form, there's a link here. Um, of course, it's not an active link, but um, go visit the HR website page and follow that student employment page and you will find this particular form to for them to complete. Um, actually, that student employment, that is, so if they uh, print the uh, or view the uh, presentation online, if they click that, that will take them right, right to that page. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, awesome. all I the blue. Had it. <laughs> right. All the blue, it. well, the blue words, they're active links. Perfect. Thank you, Wanda. Thanks, Joanne. You're welcome. The next section that we want to talk about for student hires is, um, and this is when I'll, I'm sure Lindsay will chime in to make sure we're, we're hitting all the points here, but students in extra, that's a difficult word, extracurricular activities uh, paid through AP is based on the uh, Department of Labor guidance, primarily from the D Department of Labor Field Operations Manual 10B 30 slash E. Students who participate in student activities such as student run media and student government are not considered employees for F FLSA consideration based on the Department of Labor guidance. This is Belinda's expertise. Belinda, is there anything you need to add there? Um, not at this time. That was, um, if anybody went to the student training and different things of that, we mentioned that and even on an student employment page, there's information about that as well and links to, um, to go to AP for those types of payments. And typically there is, is no employment relationship for students who are participating in extracurricular school activities if the activities are primarily for the student's benefit and part of the institutional educational opportunities. Now, I, I can see for some of these situations, you may have to reach out to HR to get clarification. And um, like Belinda said, they have presentations and they have links that, that will get you to either information that details this out or you could reach out to Belinda's group and they will kind of walk you through uh, some of these things that you have questions about. Uh, somebody uh, active, I'm Wanda, sorry. I was just going to say in most of the time when you're asking us, we need to know what they're doing, what type of work they're doing, if they're going to have a supervisor, different things like that, because all of that comes into play if determining the, the, um, the if it's a employer employer relationship. So likelihood is we're going to ask you more questions. So just so you know that and be prepared to be, have 
answer, more information than just how do I hire them. We want to know more information so we can make the right decision. Because Belinda and I had a case like this, I think it was a week or so ago, and, and it, it, she does need all the pertinent information to determine in the student's employment class. Um, some of the activities that I cited include band, intramural, and interscholastic athletics, league club, debate teams, and choirs, etc. So those are some of the examples of the activities included. Uh, students will be required to register as a supplier and will be paid a stipend using a payment request. No agreement is required. Just be sure to include a justification on the stipend payment form. That means a student is not in this situation. Student is not being paid through payroll. They're being paid through AP, which means that they will get a stipend, which means leads to a different tax form at the end of the year form. That's why you have to be very, very careful about how you classify these students and make sure you've had them classified correctly. And if and you have multiple students that you're trying to pay at one time, you can use the AP upload form and we can also, you know, send you a, a link to that information as well. But sometimes, um, you know, departments are trying to process, you know, 15 to 20 students at one time, you know, because of these uh, extracurricular activities. And uh, it, it's more efficient to do an AP upload form. So if you're interested in that, we'll have that information for you as well. And Liz, do you want to touch on the matrix there? Yes, um, we are in the process of trying to put together um, a matrix for you that would show um, the, the different types of activities that students can be paid for and whether that constitutes a, an employee employer relationship and that goes through HR whether um, it's at one of these student activities and it gets paid through AP. And there's also a financial aid component um, when you know there's fellowships or you know that kind of thing involved. Um, so we're, we're trying to work on that for you and make it a little more uh, simplified so that you've got kind of like a one stop shop so you understand um, the, the routing for different types of activities. Um, we're still working on that. There's a lot of moving pieces, but we'll get that out to you as soon as possible. Uh, the financial aid office, the controller's office, and um, HR are all working together to get that information to you. Um, if you do have questions about setting up a student as a supplier because they do need to run through AP, um, the link on this uh, slide will take you to the supplier management page. And we now have you know electronic um, onboarding for suppliers, which will make it a little bit easier. Uh, you won't have to do paper forms to get them registered as a supplier. So uh, all these links are, are active and will get you to the information that you need. Any questions before we move on? Our next session is overpayments and uh, we will have an overpayment discussion probably in every payroll hot topic that you attend only because this just is such an important uh, area with a, a lot of highlight on it. So we want to make sure that everybody truly understands um, how this works uh, when it comes to overpayments. Um, if an overpayment occurs in a grant and, and Marie and uh, Lindsay, please chime in. Uh, they will be moved to the department A or E fund as soon as grant funds management is notified by payroll. So the sponsors are not billed for the overpayment. So we have a process in place with the grants funds management team and payroll uh, touch bases on regularly to discuss these type of issues, overpayments in particular. And as soon as they, we go through and notify them, uh, grants funds management, we be in payroll, then they're going to move it to your A or E fund so that your grant is not impacted. Marie, I don't know if you want to expand on that. Um, thank you, Wanda. Yeah, uh, essentially, you know, it's important for us to move those overpayments. Um, not only do they skew effort reporting when there is effort reporting, um, but when the credits do come off or sometimes those repayment plans, um, extend past the award end date so we can't let that occur on the award since it's not always occurring within the same grant period or the same billing cycle. Because we, we try to monitor these overpayments as, as you know as much as we can but like Marie said occasionally the timing is not perfect so that's why this is key 
and any re any reimbursement of the overpayment will also be applied to the A fund. So any any uh, collection we do um, related to the overpayment will be uh, applied to the A fund. We try to collect overpayments um, as they were overpaid, um, meaning that if you, an employee is paid a lump sum, we try to collect that lump sum. But there could be extenuating circumstances that where we are come up with a payment arrangement and we may have to do it over two or three pay periods. But anytime those reimbursements are, are coming in, they're going to go against the A fund. Um, and that kind of leads us to the fact that um, accounting has to be correct on overpayments. So what we'd like to happen and what needs to happen is that if you are aware of an employee that is overpaid and um, they would like to have some type of um, arrangement made where they're paying outside of um, the lump sum payment, um, then they need to discuss that with payroll because um, we are not in a position to allow um, employees to have reduced or forfeited future earnings to cover an overpayment because you have to have the accounting correct. You have to have the audit trail correct. And in order for that to happen, we have to have a documentation of the overpayment, documentation of the notification of the overpayment and documentation of the repayment arrangement, whether or not the repayment arrangement is lump sum or over one or two pay periods because um, the audit trail has to be clear, the accounting has to be clear, and the documentation has to be clear. And it all has to almost like a little mini package per overpayment. That's why we're very, very um, careful as we work through these and we notify grants and we notify the employee and we notify the department because it's key that the accounting is accurate and that is documented well and that it's a clear audit trail. Does anybody have any questions about that? Because we just wanted to make sure everybody understands that um, you cannot agree to an employee if they collect if we overpay them in a bonus in the first quarter. I'm just going to use first quarter. You cannot agree that if they have an upcoming bonus in the second quarter for them to use that bonus as a and forfeit that second bonus to cover the overpayment of the first bonus in the first quarter. They have to be paid. We have to collect the overpayment. We have to have proper documentation of the payment and proper documentation of the of the repayment. OK, uh, the pay payroll tax deferral update, um, the uh, tax deferral. Well, we've got a couple of questions about this in, in, um, um, in payroll, and so we appreciate everybody being patient as we answer this question. But the tax deferral that the um, related to the executive order that the president signed basically allows a deferral of an employee's Social Security tax deduction between September 1st and December 31st. Um, and just so you know, we've had a, a lot of employees reaching out asking, um, you know, where, where, where do we stand in, in this position? So even if that uh, tax is deferred, the way the executive order is structured currently now, if you deferred in the last quarter of 2020, you will have to pay it back in the first quarter of 2021. A little bit over the first quarter. It went to like April 30th and then it's just a little bit beyond quarters, but I'm a so I talk on quarter basis. But if you defer it from September 1st to December 31st of 2020, you're required to pay it back between January 1st and April 30th of 2021, just to make sure I get the date specifically as they laid out. Currently, USC is not practicing uh, or not deferring any taxes. Uh, we are waiting to hear from the state controller general office to see if the university will participate because we're following the state's lead. And um, right now, one of the things we're considering is that if the controller general office does decide to do this, that we will give the employee the opportunity to opt in or opt out. Because like I said, I've had a lot of um, emails directed to me that basically said, I'm not sure this is the um, the, the correct thing for me to do and do I have to pay it back? And so it, it's just almost to the point to where it has to needs to be an individual. Um, agreement between uh, payroll and the employee. Lindsay, do you want to expand on any of that? Uh, sure. Um, so essentially the if if the state comptroller general decides that we're going to participate um, we we will do our best to see if we can offer 
it as an option to um, our employees, um, keeping in mind that essentially what it becomes in the first quarter of 2021 is a double deduction of Social Security because you would still you would yes. pick up the um, deduction again for Social Security plus be paying back what was um, deferred in the last quarter of 2020. Um, I think that in in the news, sometimes it makes it sound like it's a payroll tax holiday, meaning that and it's implied that it's a tax cut, but it's actually a deferral and that tax is still owed. Um, we still would have to work out what that would look like if an employee, if we did participate in the payroll tax deferral and the employee left before the taxes were paid back. Um, it's a it's a very complicated um, executive order, and I, I think that's why the state comptroller hasn't quite made a decision yet. It's why uh, we've hesitated on providing too much guidance. Um, and some of you may have seen, you know, news reports where, you know, companies have just straight out said, you know, we're not participating at all because it is it's a very complicated um, tax adjustment to make in a, in a system. So um, we're considering, you know, what that would look like, and we're just waiting to hear back from the state comptroller general. So this is just, um, you know, a brief update about where we're at with that. But, you know, we we completely understand, you know, your concerns about not wanting to participate um, after kind of hearing the ramifications of what that actually looks like. Um, but we will get you more information as it becomes available to us. So if anyone in, in your department asks, just please let them know that we are cons considering um, the options based on the Comptroller General's direction. I know that sounds like a non-answer, but really that's where we are. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about summer comp. Um, I want to say that we are um, here in payroll and HR are very pleased with the summer comp process. We're hoping that you've uh, had a little bit of an easier time when it comes to summer. These guys work very, very hard um, to make sure that uh, we had a smoother process and hopefully um, that that was uh, noticed in the way the work flowed. Um, over this, we've analyzed a total of 2,600, 2,683 summer comp transactions. Um, as of August 15th, because remember summer goes ends on the uh, with the August 15th payroll 2020. Um, one of the things that we noticed as we were going through that we wanted to talk about was duplicate hires, um, meaning that we would get duplicate hire paperwork, but it all goes back to the um, summer comp paperwork being timely, accurate, and um, submitted once. So that's one thing that we wanted to stress is as we look through the paperwork, um, we, we want to make sure to continue to have it on time, continue for it to be accurate, and continue to make sure that it's not duplicate. Um, we did want to celebrate that we had a 20% decrease in the number of overpayments, um, and that is a yoo-hoo moment um, because uh, overpayments require so much time and attention on our end, on your end, on HR's end, too. Because the decrease happened, we could tell that um, everyone was, was working on that duplicate paperwork when it was noticed early enough and that everyone was working on getting it in time. So the things that we continue to see, which was the, the paperwork being uh, untimely, the uh, duplicate hires and, and inaccuracies, we can tell that you were working on those. We still have to mention them because it's still a work in progress, but the 20% decrease in overpayment uh, reflects that there has been some improvement. So thank you all for the hard work for summer. Um, thank the employees for being patient as we work through the issues that did occur. And we have now analyzed all of our summer. We've reached out to employees in situations where they're over and underpaid. And so we're, we're working through all that and hopefully that will res be resolved within the next um, next couple of weeks. And we won't carry this into the fourth quarter as we have in the past. There will be one or two that float through. That's inevitable, but we don't expect the magnitude that we uh, normally have float through for the for um, for the fourth quarter. Um, we also want everyone to know that we're anticipating um, an electronic process for summer of 2021. We have a work group that has started already. Um, 
a lot of folk on this call are on that work group. I saw CG's name popped up, uh, Belinda, uh, Lindsay, Jennifer, and I, um, and a lot of other payroll folk will be working to um, to get the electronic process in place. Belinda, did you want to speak to Summer at all? Um, just I appreciate everybody's um, hard work from the, the um, colleges, divisions, and campuses because it was a little bit harder this year. Uh, I felt it was just because of all the, the COVID-19 and not being able to come into work. So we had to kind of totally revamp our business process on our side to get things to payroll because it was paper and all. So, I, you know, it was a lot of hard work involved with all. And, um, you know, um, if I do appreciate y'all sending them in salary to the salary admin box and getting those to us. And, you know, we are still kind of receiving some summer comp, <laughs> so even though it's um the end of September. So those are the things you really need to try to not occur um, because it takes a lot more time and effort to get those because it's supposed to be paid through summer. They're not being paid. So if we can really get that tried for next summer to get those timely and not coming in after 815, that would be great. Um, and just to um, echo Wanda's sentiments, you know, uh, again, thank y'all um, definitely up for for everybody for HR payroll and everybody um, a better summer with summer comp this year than last year. Um, and we are looking at how the best way to do this electronically. Um, summer comp is not an easy process with all the rules and regulations on it. So um, we're trying our best to get it electronic because we know that would be best for everybody. Thanks, Wanda. Thank you. Um, and now we want to talk a little bit about the updates on the CARES Act. Um, once again, um, addressing student loans. So uh, student loan payment relief during COVID-19 um, is scheduled to expire on December 31st, 2020. So if you have any employees that are currently um, having relief from having to worry about uh, paying student loan payments, that should start back up as January 1st, uh, 2021, as of now, based on what we know. Uh, the stuff is fluid. You guys know that you know Congress every day they have a different headline. Um, so all the stuff is very fluid, but it all these are based on what we know um, now. Um, so the time to use the following uh, earnings code, which is EPSL and EFLMA, which is personal sick leave and uh, emergency family leave ends also on December um, 31st, 2020. Um, and want, um, everyone to know that uh, as as I mentioned earlier that the student loan payments will be deducted from the uh, January 15 2021 paychecks so please be um, cognizant of this fact and pass it on to your employees of the student loan ending relief ending on December 31st and that you will no longer be able to use the earning codes for EPSLA and EFMLA as of December 31st. Are there any other updates that you guys um, would like to share? Jacob, I know student loans are a part of your um, expertise. No, all I would say is, yeah, I mean, we just wait to see what they actually say about it. I imagine it would, it would probably be a delay because we would have to wait for a notice to be sent to us to say start it back, just like we had to wait to tell us to stop the, the garnishment. But it would, we would probably need clarification on that as well. So we would reach out to the uh, student, the Department of Education for clarification. But everyone be aware, Jacob is keeping track on that. He does provide updates um, whenever he notices or sees a change come across related to it. I, I want to go back though and stress that second bullet that um, earning these earning codes, the EPSLA and EFMLA are scheduled to end on December 31st. So um, if you could share that with with um, your timekeepers and individuals who approve your time, because we do not anticipate seeing any of these codes beginning in January. And that's very key. I don't know, Jennifer, if you want to expand on that, if that was enough um, information related to that. Um, I think I'm good. OK. Thank you. Though. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, the next topic 
is uh, workman compensation and unemployment. And I will let Lindsay address this topic because she has put a lot of work into getting this process um, automated. And um, so I'll let her discuss this. All right, uh, we're excited about um, announcing this enhancement. Uh, we are now able to have uh, workers comp and unemployment run through payroll again, as it did in Legacy. Um, currently, the process is now to do a uh, journal entry allocation at the end of each payroll, and it, you know, obviously creates a, a discrepancy between HCM distribution and the, the GL because those entries don't post HCM distribution. So with this enhancement, you will now be able to see those workers comp and unemployment charges by employee um, on HCM distribution beginning with the 1015 payroll and um, it will adjust any retros that you do with the 1015 payroll and forward will move those charges um, along with the, the payroll. So that's that's exciting for us to be able to announce to you. Um, any retros that take place before 1015 um, will still be processed via journal entry, um, but slowly but surely we'll, we'll get um, go in here and uh, we won't have any of those um, manual journal entries anymore. Anybody have any questions on that? Yes, we do have a question. Um, will employees and our HR reps receive detailed information regarding the repayment of SSS tax deferral? I think that's okay. related to the, the social, social okay. uh, security tax deferral. Yes, uh, as soon as we have uh, more information on the payroll tax deferral, we'll um, push that out to the HR contacts and describe how that's all going to work. Um, for workers comp and FICA and HCM distribution, um, you'll be able to look those up individually if you want to by entering the distribution type of tax and selecting a specific pay period or month. Um, when you look on the screen for HCM distribution, you're going to see that tax column and it's going to have uh, workers comp, unemployment and FICA all included in that total. But if you switch it, uh, the, the view to fringe detail vertical, that's when you'll be able to see the breakout of each individual uh, piece of that tax component. So this is what it'll look like. If you switch this output view here, that's when you can get the, the breakdown and you'll be able to see um, it's split out between um, workers comp, unemployment, um, by, by pay period and by employee. And this actually gonna, breaks it up. I'm gonna um, put a little bit of a plug in here for uh, Joanne's presentation that they did on the HCM distribution. Um, Joe, I don't know if this is appropriate or not. If not, then tell me um, if uh, if not. But there's a very good presentation out there, and hopefully uh, Joanne can share to us where to find it on how to go through the entire ACM distribution process. If you have any questions or concerns about which all these fields mean and all the information that you can get um, from it, and it's very good. Very, I actually sat through it, so it's a very good presentation. It kind of explains all this in addition to what Lindsay's uh, laid out here. Yeah, and I will share. Thanks, uh, Wanda. I'll share where they can find all that information. OK, looks like I'm up. So uh, we are very excited to announce that time and labor and absence management. Um, that little project is now underway. Um, so we actually sent out uh, a uh, email informing every, all employees yesterday that that's the case. Um, we um, are excited because the time and labor uh, time tracking system will now be in HCM PeopleSoft and it will be a tile in employee self-service. So that's going to be great, uh, fantastic. It's going to be a one-stop shop um, for all of you. And then also absence management will be available as well. And that's where paid time off will be requested, approved, and transferred to time and labor for payroll purposes. And so this is going to impact all employees cur currently using ITAMs. 
And um, so that would be uh, students, faculty, and staff that currently use ITAMS. And then it is scheduled to go live summer 2021. So uh, we haven't given a specific date yet, um, you know, but uh, expect those change, this change in, uh, in the summer of 2021. And so some benefits for, the, um, for this system on the next slide. So, um, so it's gonna be easy access to timesheets in employee self-service. And uh, pay stubs and time cards will now be in one system. So that's that's great. You're not having to go to two different systems. Um, it's going to be great efficiency in payroll processing. So um, that is going to be fantastic for our payroll department. And then managers, uh, manager validation, employee time, and then greater reporting capabilities for managers. So some of these are kind of high level and you're probably interested in to know, you know, what does all that mean? And as we get closer to go live, uh, you know that the communication and more detailed information to you all so that uh, that becomes clear. Um, one thing we want to make sure that you are aware of is that pay cycles will not change and the commitment to our customer service will continue to be a uh, primary focus throughout this process. So training and communication. So we did send um, communication, um, our first one yesterday. And so on the next slide, we'll talk about, um, you know, what is entailed. So this is going to affect a lot of people, large number of folks across our campuses. And so um, training will be a little different. It's going to be more of an on-demand e-learning option because there's no way that we can bring in thousands of people um, to show them how to, how to use this new system. So uh, we want, we're going to make sure that we have, you know, um, job aids um, and uh, on-demand e-learning that actually relates to how you will use the system. So we'll probably break it up by type of employee. And, uh, you know, we're also going to make sure that uh, we communicate all along the way. And uh, we're trying to decide now the best way to do that. So our first thing is to actually pull down uh, to dismantle the HR payroll um, website that we started out with. This is not a full fledged project. Uh, this is just kind of adding additional modules to HCM. And those of you who are who use our financial system, you'll know that, you know, we've added different modules over the over the years and it's growing and you'll see that HCM will do the same thing. Uh, so a lot of the information on that HR payroll uh, project website does not pertain to this, uh, this to this implementation. So I think uh, what we're going to do is we're going to pull down that uh, that that website. We're going to put um, all of the training in the right place. So anything employee self-service will put on payroll and HR websites, and then anything that's specific to payroll, for example, account changes, and then anything specific to HR, which would be all those HR, all that HR contact uh, training will go to the appropriate websites. And then we're going to create a, um, a web page that will be linked to both HR and payroll. Um, specific to time and labor and absence management so that we can keep you updated along the way. But uh, we'll be sure to send out another email letting you know uh, that that website is available and that all of the training has been moved to the appropriate places. Um, if you have any questions regarding this project, please uh, contact cmteam at sc.edu. That uh, email is being monitored on a regular basis. I actually received a couple questions yesterday um, after people received our, uh, our mass communication regarding, you know, the fact that this is up and running. So please reach out to that uh, to that mailbox and uh, we will uh, do our best to answer your questions and um, and speak to any concerns that you may have. All right, our next slide, I believe, is where to find resources. So um, payroll hot topics, you know that on our in the payroll toolbox, we will place this recording as well as the PowerPoint presentation. Um, Wanda mentioned our HCM distribution training. You can find that on the home screen of the uh, controller's office website. It's listed there as well as some um, job aids. Um, we have the job aid, the webinar recording and the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, also, uh, Finance Internet uh, is there as well, and that is broken down uh, by uh, by report, and all of that information is available on the controller's office uh, homepage as well. 
Okay, so contacts. So uh, funding end dates, you can reach out to your post or board administrator, um, your PAA, and um, for questions regarding mandatory voluntary furlough uh, guidelines, please contact HR. Overpayments, Wanda's your person. Uh, if you have any questions regarding ITAMs, Judy Timmons can help you out there. And then international tax uh, would be Jacob Keel. Um, also, or, um, you know, as I said, any questions regarding time of labor, absence management, you can send to CM team at sc.edu and uh, we'll be sure to answer answer any questions. All right, so we do have some questions and I was holding off until the end. So um, first question is, uh, does payroll not charging past the end date only apply to sponsored awards or does that apply to A&E accounts as well? It applies to um, USCSP projects, so projects beginning with one or USCIP projects, projects starting with an eight. Um, anything that has a project attached to it has a uh, an end date. Um, just if, if it just has a fund and not a project, those do not have end dates, so you won't have to worry about those ending. OK, if a student was once employed at UFSC and then graduated and left, if you want to give that student a stipend, how would you recommend doing that? Um, well, I, I guess it would depend on if there's uh, an employee employer relationship there. Um, Belinda can talk to that, but if it's I, I'm not really sure what the stipend would be for um, if it's kind of like an honorarium or um and i'm not sure if mike is re referencing whether or not because they were once employed uh they were an active supplier um i'm not sure if you're talking re referencing that mike if you could clarify that it'd be great it, hey this is belinda too i would say stopping means different things to different people at mm -hmm. the university from what i have been able to gather from um, us looking at student employment. So I would want, and what we consider a stopping, and some people call stopping it a stopping, and it really is a salary because it's work that has been done. So there would need to be more clarification of that. And so I need to have a better understanding of what they mean by stopping. OK, it's a stipend that was to be given to a previous employment for work done. Uh, that doesn't sound like a stopping to me if it's for work that was done. That sounds like to me it's salary. Um, again, I would need to know what was done and if there was an employer employer relationship with that. So the, um, what did they do? Did they have a supervisor? Was it um, was it a graduate assistantship when you say staffing or something? What 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 does that mean? So if it was work, yeah, I think we need to take that one offline. Perfect. Thank you, Mike. That's what I was just about to say. OK, so you and and uh, and Belinda can have a chat offline. Um, if we are experiencing issues with ITAMs, if the system's having a glitch, do we contact Judy Timmons for that? I would say yes. And yeah, Judy is, I'm sorry, I was muted. I was talking. No, that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> Judy is a good place to start. And then if she needs to redirect the question, she will. Yeah. All right. Any more questions before we uh, before we end today's session? You're welcome, Alyssa. Alicia. All right, we have five minutes to spare before I'm sure you all um, listen to uh, the president um, at 10 o'clock, President Caslin. OK, I'm sure we'll have another payroll hot topics um, as we get probably in November and uh, we may have more information regarding those uh, payroll deductions and that sort of thing, all that information that um, that you guys were asking about. So. All right, I think I'm going to say thank you and um, we're going to end the session and uh, everybody have a great rest of your day.